are three loops that we're going to look at that go through the cerebellum. Two of these are, are what we were, are going to call closed loops. In other words, they're loops that happen all the time just to go on and check a movement, check an ongoing movement. Um, and there's a loop that goes through the vermis, and there's a loop that goes through, a closed loop that goes through the paravermis. And these are checking, say, gait movements or checking uh, reaching and grasping movements uh, and correcting them should they go off, uh, off the proper path. Uh, the other loop that we're going to look at is an open loop that engages the lateral lobes. Okay, let's start with the, uh, with the closed loop through the vermis. So the vermis, uh, each of the deep cerebellar nuclei has its section. So the vermis uh, connects to the vestigial nucleus. That is the, the deep cerebellar nucleus that the vermis connects to. So vermis, Purkinje cells in the vermis project to the vestigial nucleus, and from the vestigial nucleus, there are several targets. We're going to concentrate on this target that goes to thalamus um, and, and from thalamus uh, to neurons that give rise to the ventrocortical spinal tract. But the vestigial nucleus also uh, targets other motor control centers, in, namely the superior colliculus, uh, to the to the neurons that give rise to the tectospinal tract or involved in orienting movements, and also to the reticular and vestibular nuclei that are involved in postural control. Um, and of, of importance here is that the output to the reticular and vestibular nuclei uh, leaves the cerebellum not through the superior cerebellar peduncles, because that's really way up in the front, it leaves it through what's called the juxtarestiform body, which is part of the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So this is, uh, if, there's a, if there's an injury to the inferior cerebellar peduncle, uh, stance and posture and gait are going to be extremely uh, strongly affected. Okay, but let's concentrate on this uh, ventrolateral thalamus, the ventral corticospinal tract. So here is M1. It's, it's going down. It's going to uh, reach motor neurons throughout the spinal cord, through the ventral corticospinal spinal tract, and along the way, it gives off a collateral to the pontine nucleus. So a pontine nucleus neuron receives this information, sends an axon across the midline that then turns to go into the middle cere cerebellar peduncle and contact um, uh, the pr both the uh, deep cerebellar nucleus, the vestigial nucleus in the vermis, but also goes into the cerebellar cortex of the vermis. The cerebellar cortex processes this information, hopefully all is well, and the information then is, uh, is then sent out. The verdict is then sent out through the superior cerebellar peduncle, crosses again to the uh, ventral anterior and ventral lateral part of the thalamus. This is the motor part of thalamus. This is the part of thalamus that translates for motor cortex. And so VAVL thalamus is then going to project up to motor cortex. And under normal circumstances, the answer that is that is that is given here is all systems good. All systems good. No correction needed. All systems good. All systems good. But if there is an error then this interrupts it and makes sure that the next movement, the next iteration of the same movement is going to um, uh, correct that error. Okay, so that's the closed loop. And this takes on the order of 20 milliseconds. It's happening all the time. It's happening as I stand here. Um, and it is absolutely uh, integral, the vermis is integral to gait. And to understand the role of uh, the cerebellum in gait, it's entertaining to go and look at, um, in particular, the split be belt treadmill walking. So what this is is, uh, is um, a set of uh, an investigation or a series of experiments by Amy Bastian. Uh, and um, what she did was she built a treadmill that has two half belts. Instead of having one belt that goes together, she has two half belts. So a person walks, let's say a healthy control walks on this um, 
uh, split treadmill. And let's, and at first the two belts are going in the same direction and same speed. And now you change the speed on one. So the right is going slower than the left or faster. Well, a healthy person will start to walk faster or slower to accommodate that change in speed with one leg. So one leg is, is walking, let's say, slower than the other. The right leg is walking slower than the left leg. Well, then you, you slow it down even more. And then let's say you reverse it. Well, unbelievably, we can do that. If you, and OK, so what are the caveats? You can do it if you have an intact, working, healthy cerebellum. And the other thing that um, you really need is not to think about it too much. Okay? You just need to do it. You need to let your cerebellum do its job, which is best done without uh, cognitive control, cognitive interference. Um, and so that's really, that's really, really cool. It shows you the power of cerebellar modulation. Now, healthy controls can do this. Cerebellar patients, for the most part, cannot do this. Okay? And then this shows you the cerebellar gait. Um, if you go to this YouTube or, or you go to a similar one, you'll see a cerebellar gait. It is a discoordinated, it is an uncoordinated gait. It gets a person there, but it is, um, it is, the gait is decomposed into its individual movements. Okay. So now let's look at um, the closed loop through the paravermis. It's very similar with a couple of exceptions. So the paravermis, the deep, deep cerebellar nucleus that is assigned to the paravermis is the interposed or in, interpositus. This used to be called globose and emboliform, but that terminology is, is no longer used. It's the interpositus or interposed nuclei. And there's a rostral and a caudal one, which we don't care about. We don't care about that difference. Um, the output from the paravermis goes to two uh, major tracks. One is the lateral corticospinal tract, so that's a, of major importance. And the other one is the rubrospinal tract. And this is the rubrospinal tract that, that comes from the red nucleus. Um, it, so let's just look at that pathway. Here's motor cortex. It gives rise to the lateral corticospinal tract, which controls appendicular movement on the contralateral side. Um, along the way, it, it sends a collateral into the pontine nucleus, and a pontine nucleus neuron then takes that information sends it across the midline into the cerebellum via the middle cerebellar peduncle, and it contacts directly the interposed nuclei and then the cerebellar cortex of the paravermis. The verdict is sent out through the superior cerebellar peduncle, crosses at the decussation of the brachium conjunctivum, um, and then uh, reaches the VAVL thalamus, and from there back to motor cortex. Once again, <clears throat> This loop takes on the order of 20 milliseconds. It's always going on, and hopefully the verdict is that all is well, no adjustment needed. If there is an error, there will be a future adjustment to a future iteration of that movement. All right, and finally, there are the lateral lobes. And here we have an open loop. And this is why I, I, I emphasize um, that the lateral lobes are most important for learning. And, and the way we learn is that we, we can't do it the, right the first time. We simply cannot. And so uh, the ultimate target of, of, of this and the, uh, the, the target and the starting point of this are different. So information is coming in from a broad area in, in, the, um, in the frontal cortex, primary motor cortex, premotor cortex, supplementary motor area. And it's this supplementary motor area that I, that I think is, is most um, uh, in, indicative of how I imagine that this works, which is that you're imagining a, a, a movement. You're trying to put it together. You're trying to learn a new movement. You're trying to learn how to skip rope with a new step. And you imagine it. You try it out. Uh, but you're taking it uh, sort of mini movement by mini movement. And as you send that into the pontine, again, it has to go through the pontine nuclei. It crosses the midline, goes in through the middle cerebellar peduncle, 
And here it's going to the lateral parts of the lobes. So it goes to the dentate nucleus and to the cerebellar cortex of the lateral lobes. The output comes back from the superior cerebellar peduncle to VAVL, where it's then distributed to these to all the rest of the places. So let's say it start the information the idea started here in the supplementary motor area. The information would be uh, distributed to premotor cortex as well or primary motor cortex as well. It could be that it's uh, that it 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 starts here and it ends up at the rest of these places. So these. This is a way of getting multiple area, multiple inputs to imagine a movement and then try and affect that movement. It starts and ends in a, in a different place. It takes a lot longer than 20 milliseconds, and its effect on movement is, um, is less immediate. And it's not checking the movement. It's learning the movement, trying out the movement. So... Lesions in the lateral lobes, once again, have, less, have more subtle effects on existing movements, um, but may really have their uh, largest impact on the ability to learn new movements. Okay, in the next video, we're going to look at um, the overall uh, clinical, some, some non-motor clinical uh, effects of cerebellar lesions.